Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Rachel Ryder, welcome to the conversation today. So good to be here, John. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the New York area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about Rachel's book, Who You Are is How You Lead. I love that. And I'm super excited to unpack all of this with the audience today. As we get started, I wanted to share Rachel's bio with everybody. Rachel Ryder founded MetaWorks in 2015 after a distinguished career in HR, receiving executive coaching certification from Columbia University and extensive training in mediation, semantic experiencing, and polarity therapy. Starting as an HR business partner responsible for de developing and coaching leaders and teams at Bloomberg, she went on to specialize in leadership coaching at AppNexus since acquired by at and in Digital Ocean, the third largest hosting company in the world. And I could go on, but I'm going to pause there. Anything else, uh, Rachel, that you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation about your book? Yeah, just to reinforce that really um, my coaching specializes in somatic experiencing, which is working with the nervous system and helping folks regulate their nervous system and also the energies that the, the invisible that actually is made visible in through behaviors and um, expression. So really I'm helping folks understand their inner world and how to engage with other people's inner worlds. That's wonderful. And, and maybe part of your bio that I didn't get into, but maybe you could start by ex exploring with this a little bit more is just your, your background um, with Zen uh, mm. philosophies that uh, you spent time at the Zen mountain monastery. Um, maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So when I was 13 years old, I told my parents that I wanted to find a religion that worked for me. I, my mother's Jewish, my father's Catholic. And actually my father met my mother at a Buddhist monastery. He was a Zen Buddhist monk for many years. So we had a lot of religion in our house, but not, it was very loose. We did it all very loosely. And at 13, mm -hmm. I decided, I think, I think from a very young age, I was a spiritual seeker. So at 13, I shopped around, went to church with my grandmother, went to synagogue with my uncle and a Buddhist monastery with my father and decided that the Zen Buddhist tradition was for me. And I actually started doing week-long silent meditation retreats at the age of 13 mm -hmm. um, and have been a serious practitioner since then. It has saved my life in many ways. Well, that's, that's really beautiful. I, I was raised um, Mormon and uh, I, I sometimes will explain to people like kind of where I'm at in my own spiritual journey. I consider myself a Zen Mormon universalist. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I've spent a lot of time in, in uh, Asian countries in China, South Korea, et cetera. And, and I really, uh, you know, I appreciate the upbringing that I received. Um, but I also, I, I like um, the grounding in Zen Buddhist philosophies uh, that I think uh, really help, you know, certainly shape who I am today, but um, I think are, are very useful um, just as we interact with, with others in a very messy, complex world, right? Yeah, I totally agree. You know, one of the things that I think is actually really important and powerful in the coaching that I do is helping people not believe their thoughts but to listen to their thoughts as information that they choose, they can then choose to believe. And for me to hold that space, I think I can only do that because of the amount of work I've done with myself and knowing that my thoughts don't always have to be true. Um, and that takes a lot of work <clears throat> and a lot of space holding for myself in order to do that for others. Because when we don't believe our thoughts, there's so much more choice in any mm. moment 
knowledge. And the thing is, is our thoughts are very powerful and can be very helpful. That's, it's not about dismissing them. It's about listening to them and then deciding, is this something I want to listen to? Is this something that is helpful for me to believe in this moment? And if so, how do I want to act as a result? And I think that's one of the powerful teachings for me in terms of my own um, Zen Buddhist practice. Of course, the, the the thoughts that come into our head, the emotions that we feel, these are real to us. And it's important for us to be able to acknowledge what we're experiencing in the world, but not finding ourselves kind of beholden to or victim to what is happening within us, you know, because um, it is instructive. It can be very instructive, uh, but there's, there's so much possibility and, and there, there's so much limiting um, so, so many limiting beliefs that we all tend to hold um, that we can learn to get past and, and we, that we can show ourselves grace that way, but we can also show, you know, hold out generosity and grace for others as we're interacting with other people as well. Uh, as we can recognize that we don't have to be stuck in whatever thoughts that we're having. We don't need to be stuck in whatever emotions we're feeling, um, that we can work our way past those. Totally. And that's, what's very interesting to me about thoughts and emotions is that they get very stuck to each other mm -hmm. and that sometimes our thoughts can fuel an emotion in an unhelpful way. And if we were able to actually uncouple our thoughts and emotions and, and hang out with each individually, we actually may be able to come from even a deeper place of choice as well. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Love all of that. All right. This is a bit <laughs> of an aside, but, um, <laughs> but I, I think a great, great context for, for how we're going to be talking about your book. So let's dive into the book. Um, I always like to ask authors, you know, because books are labors of love. It's, it's hard to get your, your thoughts out on the page. Um, usually a whole life's worth of experience going into uh, what you're you're sharing now with the world. So why this book? Why who you are is how you lead? Why was this so important for you to write? And why this book? Why now? A couple of things that, you know, I think that coaching is a very private experience and happens often between behind closed doors at MetaWorks, we work with executives. And so at the highest, highest levels of an organization, and so very rarely do people get insight into what these kinds of conversations are about and how are they helpful and how are they helping? And so I thought that it would be really helpful for folks to see client stories on the written page and understand how not alone they are in their own experience. And not only that, but understand what is it that allows change to happen. And the MetaWorks method that we do here at um, MetaWorks was founded by my own experience in Zen meditation, my extensive training in somatic experiencing with the nervous system, as well as energetics. And what I really wanted this book to help people understand is that so much of what is happening in our professional lives comes from what cr we create in our inner world. And that's what I mean by who you are is how you lead. I do not believe that who you are is a fixed thing. There are mm -hmm. some folks who believe that. I do not. I, I think there's there's core, there's a core true self of ours that we each mm -hmm. have, but often that is not what we're talking about when we talk about who we are. And so my the title is really pointing to that in the moment, how you are manifesting your inner world is how you are showing up as a leader. And so if you are angry, if you are overwhelmed, if you are constantly worried about failure, that translates immediately to how you're managing your people and running your company. And what the book really posits is it doesn't have to be that way. And let me tell you how it can look and how you can work with that so it doesn't have to be that way. So that who you are in a space of ease, clarity, confidence is what shows up in how you lead. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Well, in in executive coaching, a lot of times the focus is around what's important to you, what are your goals, what are your roadblocks, how can you overcome those? Uh, how does the messaging in your book differ from, in in some ways, from that approach? <clears throat> so I really do believe that it is important to have goals. It is important to know what's important right. to you. <laughs> That's the beginning of the conversation. Where our work and the work that I do at MetaWorks differs in this book differs is we want to examine where are those goals coming from? You talked about limiting beliefs. 
what are the limiting beliefs that these goals hold? And what are the limiting beliefs that are getting in the way of you meeting these goals? And so what we're really doing is starting to examine not just the superficial, which is very important, okay? We need the cognitive, we need the concrete world. This is the world we live in. And in order for that world to be successful, to be pleasurable, we need to make sure that our inner world aligns. And so what this book talks about is understanding things like I talk about your survival mechanisms, the things that usually are what have made you so successful and are now really getting in the way. How do we examine those? How do we turn those into superpowers? How are they not making you upset at the end of the day and deeply depleted by your work day? How are we helping you show up to your family better because you're happier at work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, so, the, so getting beyond um, your priorities, your goals, and understanding what's driving all of that, I think is so important for all of us. I think it's one of the reasons why the pandemic was such an awakening for a lot of people. Um, because mm -hmm. for many people, for the first time or for the first time in a long time, they had isolation, they had space to reevaluate priorities, to reevaluate what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, that's a healthy process for all of us to go through. I think I, hopefully yeah. we can do it without a global pandemic, but, but it was, a, that was a catalyst for, I think a lot of people who weren't in that practice of, of self-reflection um, to, to, to reevaluate and to, to challenge the status quo and challenge perhaps what kind of societal norms were around what they were expected to do, what they felt like was important and really get at, no, like what matters to you really for, for real, what, what is most important um, and kind of cut through the BS and cut through the layers of, of, of conditioning and, and other things that perhaps had, had driven how we behave and how we interact with the world and how we do our work and our careers and, and whatnot. A lot of that shifted for a lot of people uh, during the pandemic. And while I under, disruption is always uncomfortable and, and people going through that kind of a process can be uncomfortable, I think ultimately it's super healthy for all of us to go through that on a regular basis. Again, hopefully we can do it without needing, you know, a global pandemic or some major disruption to be the catalyst for it. Maybe we can just build that into our daily practice. Um, but ultimately that is um, going to get us a long way uh, to getting at what you were just describing, you know, getting to the why behind everything, like what's really driving how we're showing up in the world and showing up in the world with other people around us. Um, as we talk about leadership now, uh, be, you know, again, the title of your book, Who You Are is How You Lead. Um, so who you, who you are the, as a foundational, you know, question uh, for, for each of us to kind of discover and uncover within ourselves that will directly impact how we interact with other people and how we lead others around us, um, how generous we are with other people, whether we tend to manipulate other people um, or work to empower other people, you know, all these types of leadership issues come and feed from who we are. Uh, and a lot of times people find themselves in leadership roles, not because they're a good leader, but because they have some sort of technical expertise. They were really good, you know, as a salesperson, or they're a really good in coding or name whatever function or discipline that you can think of. Often it's those that are really good technical experts who then get promoted to lead teams of technical experts. The problem is the skill sets required for being successful in that leadership capacity often don't match very well with what, you know, they've been successful at in the past. Uh, and so relationships and emotional intelligence and some of those interpersonal skills become really core to whether or not someone's going to be a successful leader, yet they often haven't really had the preparation. Uh, and so it's really important for organizations to support new leaders in particular uh, on their leadership development journey it's also really important for us as individuals to recognize that oftentimes organizations don't provide adequate support. <laughs> and if you want mm -hmm. to be successful in your new leadership role, you know, it'd be wonderful if every organization was super invested in the development of their leaders, but they're not. And, and so we have to take responsibility for ourselves in our own development. And let's talk about that a little bit in relation to your book. Like yeah. how can I take ownership over my own development and how can understanding the 
necessity of developing interpersonal skills and developing relational skills, uh, how, how does that start with me and how can I develop those capacities? I appreciate this question because this is really the foundational premise of my book, which is your relationships are your deliverables when you mm-hmm. are a high level leader. And that's very confusing for folks just because of what you said. I get promoted and promoted and promoted because of my technical expertise. And Mm -hmm. now that technical expertise, it might be even tertiary to what you really need to be doing, which is managing your relationships because people under you, maybe even levels below you are the ones actually executing. What you need to be doing is managing your relationships with the folks under you so that there's trust, transparency, effective communication. And <clears throat> the premise of my book is in that in only the only way that you can have effective relationships in the workplace, which is foundational to your success as a senior leader or an executive in an organization, is you need to have a good relationship with yourself. You need to understand what really pisses me off. Is that helpful when I get pissed off? You know, when is it not helpful? When is it okay? How, how, you know, what? Where do I favor folks? Where do I not? What and where what is this all in terms of my inner soup of self-doubt, of anxiety of failure, of overworking, of anxiety? All of those pieces fuel unhelpful relationships in the workplace, which is ironic because really when you are an executive leader, you need to be having incredibly successful and productive relationships. Mm-hmm. What's so interesting to me is that often when I'm coaching CEOs and their leadership bench below them, this can be this, this idea that relationships are your deliverables is it's, it's, I'm blanking on the word. It's like sensational. It's like, oh my God, yes, I, <laughs> I knew that, but I didn't have the words. That's why this isn't working. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's a light bulb goes off. And then they're like, oh no. So how do I do this? How do I have a productive conversation with the person that I'm micromanaging? Because I actually don't really trust them and I'm really anxious about failure. <laughs> myself, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, that's where we begin. And that's where you can pick up the book and check it out a little to start to understand what's getting in the way for you inside. What's that roadblock? Yeah. And I like the micromanaging example um, because everyone knows micromanaging is bad. Nobody likes to be micromanaged. No leader likes to micromanage people. I don't think, I mean, not really because it's just annoying. Everyone knows it's annoying. Um, It takes, it eats up all your time. Nobody really wants to do that. The problem is it's all about trust and you can say, I trust my people. You can know that that's an aspirational goal to, to have and to hold and to not micromanage yet where the rubber meets the road, you have people doing the work that you are then re- accountable for and responsible for and, and reporting up the line, you know, your results. And so it, it can really be hard to, on the one hand, know micromanaging is bad. I need to develop trust with my team. And yet it, it takes like time. It takes intentional effort over time and consistency to develop that trust. And a lot of leaders just don't feel like they have the time or they're not willing to invest the time. And therefore you find yourself in this conundrum where like, I really don't trust my people to get stuff done the way it needs to get done. And, but I also know that micromanaging is bad. So what am I going to end up doing? A lot of times people end up defaulting back to, you know, these learned behaviors that aren't healthy of micromanaging of toxic leadership of, you know, of various things, even though they know it's not good, they know they shouldn't be doing it. That's really the heart of my work is we are not leadership 101. You come to us, you know, the 101, I should be delegating. I shouldn't be micromanaging. I should be empowering my team. And I can't, I had a CEO who was managing all of the high level deals for his 500 person organization. That's outrageous. And he was, he was (laughs) totally burnt out and overwhelmed, Uh not Uh surprising. And And he, even though he understood that he vaguely understood, like this was not helpful. He was like, yeah, but Rachel, there's so much money on the line. I can't, I can't afford for it to not go well. And so this is what's so important about the work is to, first of all, I normalized that. I was like, yep, I get it. Like it has been a difficult time in tech. I understand that there's a lot on the line and 
we don't have to let go of this overnight and you are going to die using his words, actually, if you keep this up, you are not sleeping. You are completely stressed out. You are getting chronic migraines, like something needs to change. So let's talk about incrementally how that can change. And so it wasn't just, okay, I can be the final call on the, I can be the closer on the sales call, which is the cognitive concrete strategic piece. But we also examined what is the underlying fear that's actually overpowering your logical sense that maybe it's not helpful to be at the beginning of this deal? What is the crippling fear that is making it impossible for you to not insert yourself early? And what was fascinating is it came down to failing. And I'm going to simplify it. You know, the, the, the company will fail. The company will fold. I won't be able to show up for my family. And at the core of this, this is, this is where the work is transformative. When you start to understand the root cause of a behavior, that's when you can truly solve for it. So when we started to work on that fear, what was real about that fear? What was true? What was old? How young was that fear? What did that fear need to feel safe? then he could actually start to let go. That's where when we uncover the inner world piece, then he can translate that to the behavioral. Then he can make sure his team is trained, that he can trust them and he can let go little by little. And that's where the work is. That's I so appreciate what you're saying, how you know these things are not helpful and yet you're still doing them. That's the power of this kind of coaching because we're working on the nervous system level. Yeah. And I really, you know, are there bad leaders who are intentionally nefariously just bad? (laughs) They exist. Yes. But do most people wake up in the morning, like with like twirling their little mustache and thinking, ha ha ha, how am I going to exploit my people today? Like, that's not a thing. Like people don't do that. Most people are good trying to do the best they can for their teams. Uh, and they just get caught up in the grind. They get caught up in this, the pressures and the anxieties and the stresses, stressors of of the work that they're doing. And when when you are in a heightened level of anxiety and stress, you default to learned behaviors, right? And things that you've just observed other people doing, even if you know it's not good, you know it's not healthy. And so that's what we want to disrupt. We want to be able to help people see that as it's happening and choose something different, uh, even mm-hmm. though that, you know, that's the natural like response that they might be inclined to have. Exactly. Well, very good. You know, this, I feel like we could go on and on. We, we've only really scratched the surface, Rachel, but I also know at the time I'm going to need to let you go here in a few minutes. Um, so as we start to wrap up, uh, why don't you highlight anything else from the book that you think is really important uh, for, for anyone considering picking it up? Um, how this can be helpful, even transformative for leaders as they're working with their teams. And then we'll, we'll move into wrapping up uh, the conversation. I would say that everything you have lives within you. Everything you want lives within you. And what this book does is it helps you uncover those treasures, those treasures that might seem like roadblocks right now. What this book talks about is how you transform them because you've got it all. You've got your magic. It's how do we help you access it so it translates into the leader you want to be and the life you want to have. And I really think that this book can help you do that. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Um, As we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a moment to share with the audience how they can connect with you, uh, find out more about your work, your team, where they can find the book, uh, and then any final word you want to provide today. Yeah, you can find us at MetaWorks, M-E-T-T-A-W-O-R-K-S dot I-O. That's our website. You can find me on LinkedIn, Rachel Ryder. And you can also find us on Instagram at M-E-T-T-A dot Works, W-O-R-K-S. And you can find the book online in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, some of your local bookstores, and on our website. Excellent. Thank you so much again, Rachel. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Rachel and her team can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.
Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.